Welcome everybody on Zoom in the lecture hall from the future. Let's start today with a new week uh, of uh, material for information retrieval. Um, today we are a little bit uh, going to, um, to, to, to study what comes before what we saw last week. So last week we directly built the index in an idealized way. And now I would like to talk about the pre-processing. My main goal today is that you understand that this is complex and much less simple than it seems. Last week, we just tokenized with spaces, sounds easy, but I want to show you that this is very difficult and even language dependent. So we even have some languages uh, today. So what have we seen so far? Uh, we have uh, seen this structure here that is called a standard Inverted index, exactly. That's the standard inverted index. Inverted because we have the terms here with lists of documents rather than the documents as lists of terms, which would have been the original books. Uh, so inverted and standard because we're going to modify it. We are going to extend it with new features and new bells and whistles that make it even better, uh, even today. Um, so this is why it's standard. So standard inverted index. The model that we've uh, chosen so far. Uh, is based on the relationship on the model between document and terms. And we have an input that is a set of documents. I showed you that it can be sets, it can be bags, it can be lists, depending on uh, what features you want to, uh, to consider, if you want the number of occurrences, if you want the order. But last week we used the set semantics uh, where we don't care about the order and we don't even care how many times terms appear in documents. And then we saw this uh, fancy query language, uh, some Boolean query language, we could almost call it BQL if we want, as an analogy with SQL, which is just end or not, and then uh, terms in there, and then we query it and get a subset of the documents. There is no ranking, there is no scoring so far, it's just a subset of the documents. Um, this is the uh, EBNF form of the, uh, of the language that we studied. It's quite simple. And we saw even how to optimize it with the uh, 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 disjunct, uh, conjunctive uh, um, normal form uh, of any query, and then even how to, in which order to uh, intersect the, uh, the um, uh, postings lists. Um, now, how did we abstract? We went from lists of words to sets of words. So I really insist on that, that this is an assumption. In coming weeks, we might do other assumptions like bags or lists, depending on the weeks, but we have sets of words. What that means is that you can view a document as a vector of Booleans. Either a term is in the document or it's not. So it's just a vector of Booleans. Every position in that vector is one term. Maybe the first one is information. That's zero, it's not in the document. The second one might be retrieval. So there's a one, so it is in that document. And every document can be seen as a vector of Booleans. Then you know exactly what words were uh, in, uh, in a document. Just don't know how many times or in what order. Um, so we simplified things from list of words. Since it's a set, basically you can view it, that I didn't tell you last week, but you can view it as a bipartite graph where you have the documents on the left, the terms on the right, bipartite just means you have two kinds of nodes in the graph, so the documents and the terms, and then you have edges that link the documents with the terms. So there, there's a one in the vector if there's an, uh, an, uh, an edge between the two, and there is a zero if there is none. Okay, so uh, if you take the individual vectors of each uh, document uh, and uh, you transpose them because here I showed it horizontally, but when we saw the metrics, it's actually uh, vertical. So every document is, is vertical and the turns are on the rows. So we got an adjacency matrix. We saw it's very inefficient, takes uh, a lot of space. So we have a better way of doing that, which is with the standard inverted index and the postings list. So as a reminder, a document corresponds to all the postings with the same ID document ID, right? So there's three of them on the right. That would be one node in the bipartite graph and one column in the matrix. A term would be uh, one of these nodes on the right of the bipartite graph. It's a row in the adjacency matrix, and it corresponds to a postings list associated with one term in the uh, standard inverted index. And finally, the postings themselves corresponds to pairs of one document and one term. So one, one edge like that, Sorry, slightly off. One edge like that corresponds to one single Boolean in there and corresponds to one single postings 
in there. For whom is that clear? Okay. So uh, I have one uh, question for you just to test that everything is uh, clear and uh, then we'll continue with the lecture. Uh, there it is. I think it's probably this one. So here is a question. It has appeared at the exam with uh, different uh, kinds of uh, data, of course, but uh, let's see. This is a standard inverted index. There's, let's assume, nine documents in the collection. There are these terms, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so these uh, seven terms. Uh, and uh, I'm asking to you, which one of the following documents could have belonged to the original collection given that index, right? So you have to think in a reverse order because I'm giving you the index and I'm trying, I'm asking you to infer the original documents, right? So these are one, two, three, four, five, six documents which one of these could have belonged to the indexed collection? So I think I'm gonna display the index here and on your smartphones and on your screen, you can see the documents themselves. So that way you don't need to scroll back and forth. You can just directly see it. So you can select multiple answers, right? This is not a single choice question. So of course, it's an abstract question, right? Because in real life, the terms would be words, like information, retrieval, computer, science, and so on. Here I use ABC just to abstract away, just like in math, you can call X, Y, F uh, when you have variables. But the documents IDs, these are really integers, even, even in real indices, and uh, that actually will help us compress things later. Yeah, I see answers coming in now. Let's see if your answers converge. There is agreement on two of them. Some picked document three ABD. Okay, then less votes on the others. Okay, there are still votes coming in. Maybe in the meantime, can anybody tell me why the question is formulated that way? Why did I not say which one of the following documents belonged to the index collection? Why did I say could have belonged? Yes? Yes, we don't have the occurrence information. We also do not have the order. Right. So this is why it could have belonged because here I'm, I'm giving you documents with an order, right? But there is no way to know uh, if it's this occurrence and this order. Okay, so this is a wrong answer. Why? Because the documents are identified with integers and the terms with letters, right? But here this is inconsistent because I have a document A, it's a term A, right? So this is why you can eliminate this one, you can eliminate this one, uh, and then we are left with the others. Two, document two, ACFE. So you see two is in associated with A, C, F here, and E here, right? We also need to check that two is not associated with the others, right? You also need to check that. So two is not associated with D, it's not associated with B, uh, and it's not associated with G, right? So here it's, it's good. Document two, ACCEAFCAAEF. So that's the original order of the words. And we can eliminate duplicates here. We have A, C, E, F, but this is the same as this one, right? So technically it would be exactly the same. Doc these two documents here would appear in the same way in the index, but you see the difference here is the order and the number of occurrences. We cannot know, it might have been one of the two. We don't know which one, right? But they could have been. Then we have document three, A, B, D. Why is it not possible? Well, we have A, we have B and we have D, but look, we have also E and we have also G, 
right? So this is why it cannot be that document three is just ABD, right? So this is why this answer is incorrect. And here, document four, if we eliminate the duplicates, has B, C, E, F, G, B, C, E, F, G for four, B, C, E, F, but not G, right? There is no four. There is a trap here. What is this number here, the four? Yes? It's the count of the documents, right? We saw, we'll see later that it's called the document frequency. It's indeed because there's four of them. This is not an actual document ID, right? So this is why it's a different color. And I put it on purple in there. I, I, I think I also tried to make it a lighter font because here it's hard to see, but yeah. Okay, so congratulations uh, for this question. And now we'll continue with our slides. I just need to make sure that I continue from where we were, which should be here. Okay, so last time I very quickly oversimplified things and say, okay, we have the uh, collection of documents. There are lists of terms. We simplify a set of terms. We tokenize by species. And there you go, you have the index, right? Sounds it's quite easy. In fact, the exercise that you'll have uh, uh, this week is going to be that easy because we give that for free, the tokenizing. But again, it's more complex than it seems because in reality, here's what happens. You have the documents. These might be your books in the library. These might be your web pages. Uh, you need to tokenize, of course. So this is the easy part, right? You need to, to separate by space, punctuation, and so on. But then you also might need to do some linguistic pre-processing depending on the language because there's a verb conjugation, declinations, and so on and so on. So it's actually not that simple as we will see. And then only build the index, right? So that involves a lot of a lot of things. Let's start with the documents because even that is tricky. So we have a set of uh, documents in our collection that we would like to uh, retrieve. And then the question is already, what is a document, right? So first, the document on the row in a row level is a list of characters before being a list of terms or a list of words, it's a list of characters. It's stored in a binary format. So there's an encoding of the uh, characters in there and then it's, it's going to be bits. So you need to decode uh, the document in order to, uh, to uh, uh, index it. This is the same over the web. If you, if you download web pages, you're, you're getting a sequence of bytes there, right? So this is in the first place what there is. And then it's already a question of the character set that you use, right? So in the, good, in the good old days where it all started with computers and we had limited space, uh, then at least in the English speaking world, we, we had the ASCII uh, character set that only had 128 characters originally. And this, is, this can be encoding on seven, actually eight, but seven were enough. And then the second half was added later, but we have eight bits for each one of them. So that would be an easy way of encoding it as a uh, ASCII, right, with the sequence of bits corresponding to each character. Uh, I'm going to jump that one. Directly, uh, maybe you can tell me directly, um, do you know the difference between Unicode and UTF-8? Does anybody know that? On Zoom, maybe, otherwise. Nobody? So Unicode, is there anybody on Zoom? So Unicode is just a catalog. It's just an ordered collection of characters that are each assigned a number. That's it. There's character one, character two, and so on. It's very large now because we have all the uh, alphabets uh, uh, in the world, or at least as many of them. Uh, we have also now all the emojis, and uh, uh, you know there, there, there's new ones that get standardized every couple of years. But it's only a catalog of characters. That's all it is. It doesn't tell you anything about the conversion to bits. The conversion to bits is done with an encoding. The most famous one is UTF-8. The most famous one is UTF-8. Right. So UTF-8 has the property that for the easy characters, it coincides with ASCII. Right. So that kind of makes it a bit compatible. Um, but the way that UTF-8 works is that it's going to look up for every character you want to encode. So I have P, Pi, and the Euro symbol right there. So you look up what's called the code point. What is the code point? It's just the number that it has in the Unicode catalog, right? You, you just look for the reference of the character in there. You can actually 
uh, uh, query them with a search engine by the by a description of the character and you will typically have web pages that catalog all of this so you get the code points typically in base 16 so this is why it's showed that way but you could also do it in base 10 if you want um, and then what you do is you convert that code point from the unicode catalog to bits then you look how many bits do you have if you have at most uh one two three it's here I wrote less, but it's less or equal to seven, right? I think it includes seven, so at most seven bits. Then what you do is you just put these seven bits with a leading zero. So zero followed by the seven bits. So if you see a zero, when you read the text file, you know it's an ASCII character because it's the, one of the first 128 and you encode it in that way. If it's more than seven, but at most 11, then you do it differently. First, you start with a one. The one tells you that's not uh, uh, that, that, that's not just a single sequence of eight bits. Here is going to be several. And in fact, since there are two ones in there, one, one, and then a zero, you know that there are two packets of eight bits. So this is going to be on 16 bits. And then these are the 16 bits. The one zero here is called the continuation flag. It doesn't contain any information. It just tells you this is the continuation of some previous, uh, previously started encoding, right? So one, one, zero tells you you need to read 16 bits. And then you take these ones and these ones that give you the binary version, okay? If it's more than 11 and at most 16, then you do three packets. You do it on 24 bits. Then you have 1110 that tells you, beware, beware, there are three packets. So you need to read 24 bits here. Then you still have these one zeros that are just continuation flag. It tells you this is not the beginning of an encoding. This is a continuation of an encoding, right? And then again, the ones marked in black here and bold corresponds to the actual binary format. For whom is that clear? Okay, this is UTF-8. Now, very strong recommendation, and uh, now many, many companies start enforcing that uh, in their content. When you build new software or websites and so on, do not use ASCII, do not use Latin one or whatever, make sure to use a Unicode format. UTF-8, if you don't know which one to use, there's also UTF-16 uh, that, 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 that uh, goes in packets of 16 bits and UT, uh, UTF-32. Uh, but UTF-8, if you don't know, this is making it international. If you need to translate later, if you found a startup and then you're going to translate to other languages, then you will be, will, you will be ready for that. You will already be uh, capable of using other alphabets without any changes, right? So uh, this is called internationalization, and this is really something to keep in mind. You should really no longer use ASCII or these encodings, UTF-8. Okay. But this is a challenge because now if you create new documents, you use UTF-8, but if you look at the web, this is not everything in UTF-8, right? There's going to be ASCII, there's going to be ISO Latin 1. And uh, it sounds uh, easy, but actually, if you open a document, you might not know what encoded, what encoding it has. And in fact, that probably happened to you that you try to open a CSV file uh, uh, somewhere, and then there's these weird characters that appear. Where does it come from? Well, it's because it was Latin 1 and you try to open it as UTF-8 something like that. So that's the reason why the ASCII characters, you see them normally, but as soon as there are accents and special characters, they are not displayed well. This is because the encoding wasn't detected properly. So there are tricks with the uh, leading bits and so on that you can actually give some, some uh, indication on the encoding. You can also include the encoding name in the document itself, if you see the beginning of the document. But this is where it starts, and already there, to read the documents, you start with the first problem that you need to solve in an information retrieval system. So it can be user-defined. The document can be annotated. Maybe you want to use machine learning. Who knows? Can maybe automatically detect an encoding with machine learning. Right. Okay. Now another challenge might be that the documents that you download from the web might not be text documents. There might be uh, PDFs, uh, spreadsheet, text processor of various formats open some of them not open pdfs now they've been open for more than a decade but they were not originally uh, and then it means you need to open them because a, a pdf is a binary format right actually i'm not is it binary or text i think you might actually see some text if you open it but maybe not not fully but anyway it's not just like opening a text document and reading it right you you, you actually need some more work to extract the text that there is uh, that there is inside Right. The encoding of um, uh, Word and in generally many of these documents is actually XML. The docx document is a zip file. You can try it, rename it as zip, open it, decompress it, and you will see XML inside. 
right? So this is actually all XML. Right. Speaking about XML, that means that you might have to specifically unescape some characters in different ways than the backslash. So this is also something to keep in mind. This we'll cover in the, in the big data lecture as part of the format, but you need to consider that as well, right? And finally, some documents might have a binary, uh, a binary uh, um, uh, encoding, right? So you need to be careful about that. Even some data sets might have a binary encoding because you compress them. It's more efficient to, to store in a binary format typically. Um, okay, so you need to detect the encoding. You need to detect the type of documents, uh, if nobody tells you. Uh, and you also need to detect the language of the documents, because this you might also not know. And maybe machine learning can help uh, detecting the language of a document automatically. I mean, if you want to translate things with DeepL or Google Translate or whatever, you have the possibility of picking uh, detect language automatically, right? It will figure it out and then translate it. So this is something that, that can be done automatically. But again, it's not trivial. You cannot just uh, start uh, trivially uh, indexing without having figured that out. Okay, so far so good? It's already complex. It's getting even more complex now because here's a second challenge. A document might be fine-grained. Maybe a document is a single file that contains thousands of emails. Do you want to index the file as a document? Probably not. You probably want to have one document in your model for every email. So now you're going to have to actually split this file into multiple documents, more fine grains. What, works, what is worse is that it also happens the other way around. Sometimes you have multiple files, but these are the same documents. Think of uh, LATER. For example, if you prepare a LATER paper or a LATER book, then maybe, I'm not sure how to pronounce this one, LATER, 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 anyway. Um, so if you create uh, uh, one file for each chapter or for each section of, uh, of your LATER documents, then uh, this should still be considered a single document because you might have a book with 10 files. So this is also something that is not trivial to, uh, to figure out, right? Okay. All right, now let's dive into the next step of the uh, actually the uh, how we start tokenizing things. So here's this example that we had last time and that I passed very quickly over. Uh, if you look here, one step that we typically start with is, uh, so we use the spaces typically to tokenize, at least in English, but I'll show you it's not that easy in all languages. But in English, we use the spaces, then we can remove punctuation. Sounds easy, right? But it's not easy because look at these examples. You might have email addresses. The point is not a punctuation. It's part of the email address, right? The at arrow base also isn't. These are the question, the question tags in English, right? You don't want the apostrophe to be just a separator that will not make any sense anymore. Then you might have family names like Jake O'Neill here with the apostrophe. Uh, you might have dashes in English. Uh, like this, the learn it all by heart methodology, what do you do with that? You still need to separate the dashes in that case, right? Because you want to index learn it all by heart. So the dashes in English are a bit special because there's no rule about that. Uh, you, you are basically free to put dashes or not dashes. It's basically based on the readability. If you want to make it readable, then probably when you use nouns together as an adjective, the dashes are a good idea. If you just use noun, 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 then probably you shouldn't put any dashes because people are used to seeing uh, sequences of nouns, right? So this is also something uh, that can be a bit tricky. In German, it's easier. You just uh, paste the words together. Uh, if you don't, that's called the Deppenleerzeichen. I think Deppenleerzeichen. Um, so you're not allowed to do that. You really have to put the words uh, together in German, right? Uh, but there is still something that's not easy for non-native speakers is whether or not you add an S or an N in between. That is not very easy to figure it out. The antivirus still is bothering us. Okay. Then what's there? So you might have words that in English don't have dashes but are pasted together. This is actually something interesting because even though in English, technically, you should use dashes or spaces to separate words, there is something interesting happening is that over centuries or over decades, the dashes tend to disappear. For example, doormat, it's a single word now. Keyboard, it's a single word, but it used to be two words. 
uh, websites is still a bit ambiguous. So it takes time, but after a while, if you use specific words so often, then you start pasting them together, just like you would in German, right? And these days it's actually happening quicker and quicker because now it only takes a few years for this to uh, actually happen. And then you have the problem of uh, proper names. So when you have a, a, a single concept, like Canton Basel Stadt is a single concept, but it's made of three words here. So here, this is a case where it's not a good idea to separate with the spaces um, because you're losing the, uh, the fact that in particular Basel Stadt uh, belongs together. So it's not so easy. And here are some food for thought uh, that should make you think even more, just to show you that this is extremely complicated. Look, look at, for example, these cheap San Francisco, Los Angeles fairs and figure out how to index that. It's a nightmare, very hard to figure out. Um, all right, so these are examples that come, it's uh, one of the quarters of the book, uh, uh, Professor Schutz. Um, all right, the book we are using in the course, right? Okay, now you have the numbers. What about dates? What about phone numbers, the slashes, the parentheses, the points, the dashes, and so on? Every country has a different way of dealing with phone numbers. In the US, you typically put in parentheses the area codes. Uh, in uh, Switzerland, you have uh, three, then three, then two, then two. In other countries like France, it's two, 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 uh, and so on and so on, right? So this is very complex. Then you might have dashes in phone numbers, or you might not have dashes in phone numbers. Uh, and so on and so on, right? IP addresses. So these are all corner cases. Now, if you look at languages, uh, le let's just go through a few languages. So in English, it's often said that English is very easy to learn. Um, it's very easy to learn because in the first years where you learn English, there's a lot of things that are easy. For example, conjugating verbs is easy, right? I would like a coffee, you would like a coffee, you would like a coffee. It's always the same thing for all the, uh, for all the persons. Well, here we are lucky it's an auxiliary, right? But in general, you still remember to add this S on the third person, right? Uh, I drink a coffee, he drinks or she drinks a coffee, right? So this is the only thing that you need to, uh, to pay attention to. So in English, it might be a bit easier, right? If, if really all you need to figure out is this, then, uh, then that helps. Then you have the past tense. If it's just about adding ED in English, then that's okay. But look at all the verbs that are irregular drink, drunk, drunk, for example, then it doesn't work by just uh, removing the ED, right? Um, so here, that's uh, this third person that is kind of uh, annoying us. And to make it worse, the S actually disappears if you have a subjunctive tense, because if you have a subjunctive tense, then even the third person doesn't have an S uh, anymore, uh, even though I think this is more like in the US that we remove the S for the subjunctive. I'm, I'm not sure if in the UK, uh, this, uh, this is actually, uh, still in use. Uh, now I found a language in Europe that doesn't even have an S, an extra S or anything, where you really have all of the persons uh, conjugated the same. Anybody who speaks Swedish? Anybody in the room, in the Zoom? Okay, so it's uh, here. I, I, I love the, the, the way it sounds in Swedish. It's very musical. Um, so Swedish, the, the way that I visualize it, has the simplicity of English in the way that you conjugate things and build sentences. Um, it has the vocabulary of German in the sense that many words actually resemble uh, 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 German. Um, and it has the sentence structure of French because you don't have these things like in German, you have to have the verb at the end in subordinates and so on, or even something that I, that I learned that is implicit. Did you know or did you notice that in Switzerland, in subordinate, in Swiss German, it's not in the last position, it's in the third position very often. Basically, make it late enough that it's no longer in the second one, then you put the verb, and then you continue with the rest of the sentence. So this is also uh, yet another challenge to figuring out the order, right? French is one of the more complicated ones that there is a different conjugation at every single um, every single person, and then you add all the tenses, like uh, imperfect, uh, passé composé, all the subjunctive, conditional, and so on. So this here is very, very challenging to actually, uh, to actually um, conjugate. And French is also very tough for pronunciation. If you want to figure out how to pronounce all of this, if you don't speak French, it's very complex. But you might not be surprised because English is just the same. If you don't know how to pronounce an English word, it's difficult to figure it out. Uh, even native speakers, if you give a word that nobody knows, 
they might not be 100% sure of how to, uh, to actually pronounce it, right? German is easy. In German, you have a bijection between the, uh, the actual pronunciation of the words and the way that they are written. So German is easy. Uh, we'll see later, I think next week, when we look at how to index words and do spell checking based on the pronunciation, that it's actually uh, much easier to do it in German than it would be uh, to do it in English. So in English, we only use some sort of approximation of this to, uh, to find out how uh, to, to, to deduct the uh, pronunciation of words. Uh, all right, oh, here I have German, right? I assume, I think almost all of you, who speaks German here? Not necessarily mother tongue, Swiss German? Okay. I think a majority. Um, so German is like French in the sense that you conjugate, but uh, the pronunciation is much easier. Okay, but I don't need to speak much about German here. You, you know the, the thing. You also know that this is one of the longest words. Donau, Danschipartz, Elektrizitäten, Hauptbetriebswerk, Bau, Unter, Beamten, Gesellschaft. Back then, I don't know if it was beaten now, but that used to be the, the, the world record of German. Uh, well, there's one per language, right? But in German, that was the longest word uh, that you would have. I think it's 80, 80 characters or something. And of course, that happens because you paste words with one another uh, in a series like that, where in English, it would be separated by, uh, by spaces. Now you imagine, how do you index that? You need to figure out, to put it in a standard inverted index, you want to separate it. Donau, Dampf, Schiff, Fart, Elektrizität, Haupt, Betrieb, Werk, Bau, Unterbeamten, even Beamten and Gesellschaft. So you see this, this is absolutely not easy to figure out uh, compared to just spaces. Okay, what do we have? Oh, Swiss German, here's another one. So in Swiss German, in addition to the, uh, to the third position I told you about, you also see uh, some structures that are different from German. It's, it's similar to German, but not quite. For example, in German, so here in Swiss German, you had thanks to Hegischen Kaffee Welle Trinke. In German, you would say, you gedacht, du hättest einen Kaffee trinken wollen. Right, so you would swap the two. So you see that even with dialects, it can be a bit, uh, uh, a bit different. And then the complexity of Swiss German is also the fact that there is one way to speak Swiss German for each village. Uh, in Switzerland. So you have this, uh, who knows the Huchirashli Oracle? You never heard of the Huchirashli Oracle? There is a website. It asks you, how do you say match? How do you say marmalade? How do you say all these things? Then it pinpoints you to exactly one village in Switzerland. Like this is where you come from, just by the words that you actually use. Uh, and it's just a few words, like five or 10 words, and it's enough to actually uh, figure out uh, your village. Um, um, uh, yes? I think he has a question. Uh, yes, maybe the. It's true that the, the people on Zoom that way they can hear what's going on. Yeah, um, you know, once in a while uh, in German, at least they change the way how you um, how you spell things. For instance, Dampfschifffahrt is not um, anymore two F is three. Not ah, F. yes. You know, every forty years or so things change. Mm -hmm. How is this incorporated in other languages? Um, I don't know whether there's a, a committee that changes this and then everything needs to be adopted. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right that this is a challenge. So for the non-German speakers, just to make clear what happened, something like 20 or 30 years ago, I can't remember exactly when that was, there was a, a big spelling uh, a change in, in German. And uh, for example, the rules for the double S and the S sets actually changed. Uh, in Switzerland, it's easy. We just put double S everywhere, right? But uh, in uh, in Germany, there is S and S set. So the rules changed for that. And then there were changes of rules, just like here. Let me show you. All right. Look right here. There is a double F. But if you actually look at the words, Schiff has two F. Fart is supposed to have one. And I think if I get it right in the new spelling, you're supposed to have three Fs now. So that way it's actually making it easier than before. So in that case, the new, the new spelling rules actually are, are helping us. Yeah. But there was a change also in 18 something something when they, you know, this is, this is not the first time they changed it. Um, this oh yeah, it changes happened. all the time. Yeah. I don't know, I just know about these two instances. Mm -hmm. And so and my question is now how you incorporate this in other languages, they might also change every hundred years how they mm -hmm. spell things. So it's difficult to, to index documents over 
you know, this dimension is uh, absent. You know, this, Absolutely. This dimension. Yeah, yes. It's a huge challenge. I don't think there is any systematic method. Maybe now with, uh, you could imagine with, uh, with the new artificial intelligence tools we have, it might actually help a bit. Um, but in German, I mean, what I noticed when I learned Swiss German is that it made it easier to understand uh, middle-aged German. Like if you understand uh, Swiss German, you can actually understand middle-aged uh, German documents. Um, what's interesting to, to see, it's actually uh, um, uh, quite interesting to see at the evolution of our, like a thousand years of German, what happened globally is, uh, is um, I can't remember the exact term for that, but basically the idea is that P became F and then F, like apple, apple, water, Wasser, T became S. That happened twice in the history of the German language. Exa almost exactly the same change, but twice. So this is why P the first time, then F, then F. Um, and uh, what is interesting is that it did not happen everywhere. It actually happened in some regions and not others. And this is why now you see a difference between like Swiss German, uh, the German that you see in Germany, then ne the Netherlands, Belgium, and then the UK. So the, this whole region, if you look at the per, 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 ter, 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 and so on, you see a pattern from north to south. South, And this is how you, you actually have linguists that are experts in that, but there is, uh, there is the uh, Niederalemannisch, Mittelalemannisch, Horalemannisch, Höchstalemannisch. So the Valley Sortuch is actually different precisely because it's Höchstalemannisch. So you, you see, th th there are actual researchers that study this, and this is extremely challenging because to, to put that in, uh, in uh, information, I, it's almost a use uh, case by case basis, I think, when, when you do that. But again, with artificial intelligence, uh, uh, things might actually evolve. I tried chat GPT also in other languages than English. It's actually, uh, I mean, of course, it does mistakes, but it also works uh, with other languages. It's, uh, it's quite impressive. All right. I, did I address what you? It happens not only. Oh, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. all languages. Well, mm -hmm. it takes the last uh, thousand years of documentary. But... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, luckily, in many systems, you do have one main language. Uh, like, for example, if you're, uh, if you're in a university that is international, of course, maybe not, but typically in a small library. Uh, in a given country, they will have the local language and focus on that one. Yeah. But this is one of the challenges that actually search engines have, like Google, Bing, Yahoo, they actually have that challenge because they want to index the whole world. Yeah. Uh, okay, this is Chinese. Do we have Chinese speakers? Okay, so you probably understand what this is. This is from Wikipedia. I was told, because in Chinese, there, there, there are plenty, thousands of characters uh, that you have to learn by heart. And there's the traditional and the simplified uh, uh, characters. And I think that this mixes the two, uh, which, was, uh, which was said in a, in a class in a previous year. Um, and then there is pinyin. Pinyin is uh, using the Latin alphabet to express, uh, to express uh, uh, the same. It might make it easier to learn. But basically, in Chinese, the grammar rules are a bit easier because you, 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 you also don't really conjugate the verbs, even in the past. Uh, like if you, if you, I, I don't know, like an example, um, um, I'm happy, it's exactly the same, uh, the same conjugation every time you just change the person that actually makes it close to English in that sense. But if I'm correct, again, I'm not a big expert in, in, uh, in Mandarin, but I think even in the past, you just add yesterday or tomorrow, is that correct? And then you don't change the verb, the conjugation. Uh, so this also makes it completely different to index, especially since you don't have just like in English 26 characters. Here you have thousands uh, of characters. Um, okay, here's another one. This is uh, this is Hindi. Do we have Hindi speaker? Okay, is Kamle me koi Hindi? Bol sakta hai ya sakti hai? on Zoom. Okay, so let me explain. Unlike Chinese, we don't have thousands of characters. We actually have between 50 and 60 of these characters. This is actually a consonant vowel based uh, system. So what's going on is that all of these characters here, this is a consonant, this is M. Uh, this is a vowel because it starts with a vowel. This is E, this is an S, so ne, is, term, T. This is a, these are all consonants, T, this is an R, this is an M. 
the vowels are actually implicit. By default, it's an A if you don't have anything, basically an A. And if you don't, if you have something else than an A, then you will see, let me find an example somewhere uh, here, uh, retrieval. So this is information retrieval, RE, this is an I, pronounced E, and this is a long E if it's on the right. So retrieval, this is an O. So you see that the vowels, they, they, they appear connected to consonants, but they are not in the same form if connected with a consonants as they are if they're on their own, because this, this E here is on its own because there's not cons no consonants, but it's actually the same as this one. So you see it changes. So this also makes it more challenging to actually parse uh, to, uh, to, uh, to put in an information retrieval system. Um, so this means I will learn well this semester, and this means I like information retrieval, which is information retrieval Bahut Pasampe. But what's interesting here, a few, key, a few things, it has declinations just like in German. It's actually very close to German. It has the oblique case, just like you have accusative, nominative, uh, genitive, and so on. But you get this with uh, an oblique case plus uh, 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 some preposition. In the present tense, it makes a difference between a male and a female speaker. If you say, uh, it's a male, it's a female speaker. So you make a difference in the, in the present. This here is the verb to be. In fact, in Hindi, you can no longer conjugate in the present. That doesn't exist anymore. You have to use the verb to be and use what is called the habitual participle to put it with it, right? So that would be the third, the third person. Um, but you have, this is actually very, I, I like this trivia, right? In the future, it exists. So the future you can do. Rahunga, uh, no, parhunga, parhungi. You can actually do it in a single word, but not in English. In English, you don't have that. I will study, right? So you see, this is also, this has to do with the evolution of languages because in the precise case of Hindi, there used to be a presence. It would have been uh, parhung, Par, par whom would have been the, the present back then, but now it's the future of the subjunctive. So this is a, yet another example of how languages are actually uh, evolving. All right. Uh, all right, I spend a, a bit more time on this because I find it beautiful from an engineering perspective. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's extremely pleasant to, uh, to actually study. Before the break, let me show you another language that's Siberian Yupik. Does anybody speak Siberian Yupik on Zoom? Nobody? Okay. So this was hard to find. I actually I had a lot of, uh, it was a challenge to find this example. Okay. So it says, but I'm going to translate it for you. This neg means eat, yaktug means to go to, yug means to want, u is no, uh, the past is with uh, uma, then yag is some frustration, like whoever is saying that is frustrated. And then pet means that you're saying it turns out that, so it's inferential or evidential. And then uh, this is the person speaking, A, it's like in, in Hindi, you would have the, um, no, actually that's not the gender, that's the person. So in all languages, you almost have that. So the third person and lu means also. So basically you can conclude that this translates as also, it turns out that she or he wanted to go eat it, but. That's the frustration part of the but. Um, so here you can see how to index that in an information retrieval system. I think that would probably be the most challenging right, to, to do. Um, in fact, this language is, uh, is uh, I think, almost extinct. And uh, th there are very few examples. That actually I found in a scientific paper by a linguist uh, who was studying the, uh, the language. Um, there is an, does anybody speak Turkish? Yes, in Turkish, I think uh, there are also, when you have the verbs, you, you paste them together, like e yim, when you say I am good, e yim, it's also something you paste together, and you also have these kinds of uh, structures that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that combine without any spaces, right? I'm done with languages. What I wanted to do, we're gonna have a break now. What I wanted to do is just make you understand and aware that this is very, 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 very tricky. This is very highly language dependent. And in fact, a lot of people who build information retrieval system 
they almost have to educate themselves in linguistics in order to, to understand what is going on in order to, uh, to build the system. All right. Um, OK, so let's stop here for the break. Uh, and uh, we are going to, uh, to meet again at uh, uh, 15 past uh, uh, 11 for the continuation of the lecture. It's going to be a bit shorter today because I have to give a, a talk in another building. So you will get to get to go, to go to the Menza a bit earlier. Um, so I'll see you in 15 minutes at quarter past 11. Thank you. <laughs>